and one interviews. Um, TV interviews is going to make down there. I have talked to some of you guys that want it. Um, and uh, the photo session is going to be around here. We have persons and people that are going to show you where you're going to be and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So uh, once again, very welcome to Stockholm and Bauhaus Gala. And we start up with the uh, starting lineup for this press conference. And it's uh, the 200 meters guys. Uh, we start up with Steven Gardiner and Ramil Guleyev. Welcome. Applause, wow. Welcome to, to Stockholm, guys. Uh, have a seat. Together with me, I have uh, Johan Storokers. That's, uh, yeah, let's start. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, we'll start with Ramil. Uh, your season best is 1990 from a great performance at the Bislett Games, the IWF Diamond League meeting in Oslo this Thursday. Can you tell us a little bit about the race? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I competed uh, two days ago in uh, Oslo. The com competition is going great and the result is good. I think my form is coming and uh, we want com good compete in European Championship and we o do all program for European Championship and um, I hope so uh, we can do here something interesting. And what's interesting yeah. at the 200 meters? Time, technique, anything? What, what? Yeah. what would you focus on? The time, the result, or any about your no, no, sprinting? No, no, only, uh, uh, only enjoy race. Okay. <laughs> um, the stadium record here in Stockholm is 1977. Uh, a result... Uh, from the legendary athlete Michael Johnson of the United States of America. Will that stadium record res survive tomorrow's meet? Yeah, I think so. It's uh, whether it's, um, if we have tomorrow good weather, I, I think it's possible to do a new record. And uh, in my plan, I want to do in a new European record in this season. Uh, we try. And we see what's going to do. <laughs> uh, what aims do you have for the European Championships in Berlin? What aims, uh, ambitions? Uh, we want to compete in 100, 200 and relay. And um, we have so many times to European Championship. And uh, we do in program and uh, we see then what we do there. Okay, Steven. Uh, what are your aims and expectations for tomorrow at Bau Skaland, the IWF Diamond League in Stockholm? Well, tomorrow, I'm just happy that I'm getting a chance to run my first ever Diamond League 200 and dropping down from the 400 to the 200 and just have fun out there. Um, do you have any special thoughts about tomorrow, about uh, the distance? the competitors, the feeling in Stockholm, in this historical stadium? Ah, yes, the competitors are always, always good, but just looking for good weather tomorrow. And once it's sunny, then anything is possible. What do you think about the stadium record 1977 and tomorrow with this world-class start list? Well, you know, once the weather's good, then it may not last, it might, but we'll see about it tomorrow. Okay, um, any questions from the floor? Please don't hesitate to ask any questions. No, take this one. Thank you. Uh, a question for Stephen, thank you. Um, in, on the Diamond League circuit, uh, it's no secret that you've had considerable success so far this season over the full lap. Um, so congratulations on a, a great season in your specialist dis discipline. Um, just, I presume that, that makes you full of confidence uh, heading into tomorrow. Um, are you hoping for yet another 
Diamond League victory? Um, you know, I just want to go out there and have fun. Tomorrow victory to come will be another success for me, but I just want to go out there and compete against these guys and have fun. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Stephen, just wondering if you woke up to the news of what Michael Norman ran in the US and wha how you think that might affect the current landscape in 400 meter running and what you thought of his performance. I mean, it's, it's a great running from him, but every year it's someone new, so it was no surprise to me. And for the questions? Uh, I'll ask one more, if possible. Uh, for Stephen as well, um, has it been a strategy of yours, I suppose, to work on the speed specifically over 200, given what you ran earlier in the year and the fact you're running it here? And do you think that's going to translate into a quicker 400 later in the summer? Ah, uh, yes. That's one of the main plans me and my coach are working on, getting my 200 a bit faster for my 400. So it's all planning out and it's all playing a good role. So, yes. And another question for Ramil. Um, obviously, when you won the World Championships, it was a bad night and it wasn't the fastest time in terms of weather. Um, do you think, like, your performances this year, being able to beat the field in Oslo and run 1990, prove is proving to people that that was no fluke? Um. Um, I'm just saying that. Do you think? Do you believe that running faster times and backing up your gold medal from last year is proving to your competitors that? You are one of, if not the best 200 meter man in the world. Um, in London, have uh, bad weather, and uh, we races it three, three times. And when you compete in uh, races one time, it's uh, different because you can concentrate for one race and uh, show one good result. When you compete in three times, you need uh, in heat you need win, in second final you need win. And then you need uh, showing the all in final. In there, so important strategy and so uh, techniques, because if you want to win, everybody watch you. Uh, everybody want make support. Stadium it's full, and so very big uh, pressure you feel. And then uh, you need concentrate only for race, only for techniques, and uh, then you do uh, everything's good, and you can. Uh, chance to win but in a, when you're running one time you can show some good result and uh, you can running fast only for yourself and only for showing you perf uh, your perfect performance example yeah. and has life changed at all for you since you won the gold like in terms of being in public or do you get recognized a lot more since London um, I have now so many, uh, uh, so more um, uh, chance for showing so good result because uh, when you win, so you, you are some important sportsman and everybody want to you run too fast, and uh, I hope so for uh, I can show do more uh, f after when when you win something. You have some more uh, how's the motivation for doing. Um, for Stephen again, thank you. Uh, 1975 national record back in April before uh, concentrating on your, your 400s. Um, have you been um, not concentrating so much on your sp speed endurance work for the two since April, or are you confident of in in this race tomorrow with Ramil of possibly bettering that that national record and, and getting the meeting record like Ramil wants as well? Um, yeah, um, I've been working on both because I'm now in both events. So I one day I'd work on the 200, next day I'd work on the 400. But I always keep both in mind. I don't just skip one for the next one. But you know, I'm just looking for a good race tomorrow. Any further questions? Looks like we are good. Okay, guys, sounds like it's going to be a great race tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yes. Good. And how's your stay in, S in Sweden and Stockholm so far? Is it good? Yeah, I like Stockholm. My second year here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're glad that you are here. Really good. <laughs> and now it's time for individuals. Uh, please 
come with me. We have some requests for both of you guys. Uh, so now we take a short pause and uh, get back. You want more pictures? Of course, please, guys. Have some. Have a seat, and then we take some more pictures here, and uh, then we go.
Okay, let's start up again. Press conference for the Bauhaus Gala and Diamond League here in Stockholm. Uh, now, this session, we will focus at uh, the women's 1500 meters. So up on the podium will be Meraf Bata, Janice Simpson and Brenda Martinez. Welcome. So have a seat. Okay, welcome. Hi. How's Stockholm? Good. Yeah? Yeah, good. Have you landed and you have... Yeah, it's good. Find your room at the hotel and yeah. so on? Yeah. Good. Um, we're going to start up because, uh, yeah, we want to do this. And we are so interested to hear what your thoughts about tomorrow's race. Here is Johan Sturrockers. My colleague will go on from now on. Yes, I changed position because of the TV cameras. Uh, we start with uh, Jenny Simpson. We're honored to once again have you here in Stockholm as an athlete at our meeting. How is it to compete here in Sweden with all the spectator, spectators and athletic fans? I love coming and competing in Stockholm, and one of the, my favorite reasons is because um, as just a collegian, I came and raced here uh, in a Colorado uniform and won the 5K. And so every time I come back, I kind of think of my uh, long time ago, early beginnings. Uh, also, the last time I was here, I raced the 1500 meters and had a lot of success in it. So um, I'm ready to give it another go. Hopefully, Stockholm is good to me again. OK, uh, what about tomorrow? What are your aims, uh, result, uh, position at the 1500 meters this coming Sunday? Yeah, so Sunday the field is really loaded. It's really good. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to get out and compete really well and, and be in podium position, hopefully. Um, but I started out my season at the Prefontaine Classic, uh, ran a really fast time there. I uh, did some maintenance stuff throughout the last few weeks, including racing in Hengelo, um, just to get ready to come here and be competitive. So, yeah, I, it'll be, I, I hope it's, it's fast and it's, it's quick and uh, the competition will be really good, so I think we can expect that. Uh, it's an athletic year with no world champs or Olympic Games. What are your ambitions for the outdoor season, uh, IWF Diamond League circuit and other competitions? I think that on a year that there's no world championships or Olympics, I think it kind of works out well for fans at Diamond League meets because all of these meets become that much more important to us because we don't have our whole season focused on just one championship week. Um, and so I think throughout the season, whether it's you know Doha first for me and then pre and now coming to Stockholm, uh, the, every Diamond League is that much more important. So I think the fans will get a better show. Okay, we go to Brenda. Uh, what about the 1500 meters tomorrow for you? A great field, uh, as you see here, an uh, arena with a lot of atmosphere. What are your feelings? Um, I'm excited coming in. It's, it is a stacked field. Um, I feel like we're maybe two to three seconds within each other, so we're all kind of right there, and I'm just hoping that it's a fast race and it's just another opportunity for me to run fast. Um, but yeah, this is my fourth time being in Stockholm, and it's, it's always been good to me. And um, yeah, I, I'm just looking forward to it tomorrow, and I just really hope it's fast. How fast? Uh, well, I've, I opened up at pre with Jenny as well in the 15, and I ran 402, so I was really excited for that. So I just want to build up on that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Meraf, uh, tell us a little bit about your feelings and uh, expectation for the race tomorrow after the first meet this year. <laughs> In English, please. Uh, yes, I'm so really happy. So, uh, for Stockholm study, I'm always happy. Yes, very excited for tomorrow. But for me, it's very good for uh, training for because I got to compete in the European Champion ten, uh, 5K and uh, 10K. So that is good for me for speed training. Uh, if we look forward uh, to Berlin, what uh, are your ambitions there? You won the 1500 meters uh, in uh, Zurich in 2014. 
Yeah, the series are going to 5K and 10K in European Champion. So that is... Uh, it's Fort Morris, Fort Morris does some tr uh, speed training for me. So I am working to training so hard for uh, for long run or s so for... Okay. Um, any further questions from the floor? Please don't hesitate. A question for Brenda and Jenny. Just wondering, coming from such a different time zone, how you managed to deal with jet lag? I know, Jenny, you, uh, there was a piece in Runner's World where you talked about it going to Doha and back to Des Moines in the space of a week recently. Mm. Um, what are your tips, I suppose, for other athletes, and how do you deal with that messing up the body before a race? Well, for me, I try not to overthink it, but um, I, I, I do try to come in like a few days early. So I did compete at Oslo, so I was here three days prior. Uh, and I probably had a little bit of trouble the first two nights, but I think before that, I've, I've been pretty rested. I've been pretty good at sleeping, you know, seven, eight hours at night and napping like two to three hours. So I'm really caught up on my sleep. Um, but I know, I know I adjust pretty well and just make sure I'm taking care of myself and the little things. I think the body loves routine and loves rhythm. And so the best thing you can do is come here and stick to a training schedule and stick to kind of your regular meals and just kind of force your body into that new schedule. Um, and But yeah, I mean, the more routine you can keep. Uh, I also think when you travel for leisure, you realize how much running really helps uh, get your body back on schedule and feel good. Uh, cause when we land, a lot of times we head out and we go for a run right away. Uh, just, you know, we say to like shake the, the, the plane out of our legs, but it's also to start kind of getting your body on this cycle. The sun is up, it's time to run. Uh, and then when you go on vacation, you realize like you're jet lagged for like so much longer cause you don't <laughs> stick to that routine. So I really do think those things make a big difference. And I'll just ask one more while I have the mic too, Meraf. Um, you've obviously competed all over the world, but to come back to Sweden, what sort of boost does that give you competing in front of a home crowd, especially tomorrow we're expecting pretty much a capacity crowd here in Stockholm? Yes, yeah, very excited. Uh, home, home, uh, home's uh, story more, so very, I'm so really. <laughs> Uh, can you put the English and <laughs> easier for me since first It's okay, we can translate. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Go ahead. Also, I'm very, 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 very glad that you have a plan. Also, the hair for me is that you some snap yet stabling. Så för att jag ska tävla på 1500 i European Champion är så väldigt bra att tävla 1500 och det är bra för mig. Det är tävling väldigt bra, bra i bestånd. Uh, Merov says that it's uh, great to be here in Stockholm. She's really, really excited for tomorrow's race and uh, also that uh, it's uh, special that it's going to be 1500 meters tomorrow because she's qualified to the uh, Europeans in other distance. So it's going to be great and, and uh, a good day, a fantastic day tomorrow. A uh, question for uh, Jenny and Brenda, thank you. Um, obviously with, with no major championships in, in 2018 for you guys, uh, am I right in thinking that the focus is purely on, on, on times and diamond league points? Uh, and perhaps uh, honing new m new race techniques and uh, pacing plans uh, ahead of Doha next year. And a second part to my question: uh, Would you would you kindly um, tell us your thoughts on having the likes of Laura Muir in the in the race tomorrow? Uh. <laughs> yeah, I can I can go. Yeah, can yeah go. It's <laughs> a non championship year. I mean, obviously, it's a really great opportunity to to really focus on the head to head. And um, we and and to do that repeatedly throughout the year. So uh, when there's opportunities to run fast, that's I think really an exciting thing in an off year because there's not, you know, 
the preparation that you need or the world rankings that you want going into the world championships, that's not at stake. So, uh, so clearly the, the Diamond League becomes the focus, um, which then really puts to together a more of a collection of races over the year. So that's, so that's kind of a fun thing about an off year. Uh, it's always really great to have Laura Muir in the race. Um, anytime you have somebody of that caliber in the race, it just raises the level of expectation for the field. Um, and so she, along with others in the meet, I think they just raise the caliber of the race. And it's the as the expectation gets higher, um, everybody in the race uh, is, is ready for a good run. So, yeah, it's good she's in it. I don't think there's any pressure, like, to – to like obviously not make a team like or to make a team um so I felt like with my training it's I've kind of been able to like you know prioritize and be like okay I don't have to rush to run or be sharp you know before nationals so that's kind of been good on, on my part um but but yeah I think this year is just about having fun racing to my potential and just getting into meets and just trying to post some fast times and I mean, with Laura Muir and alongside with Jenny, it's these girls kind of set the bar high, and that's the standard. Um, and I know it's never going to be an easy day when we, we toe the line with them. So I'm appreciative of it, but they also keep me on my toes, you know, throughout the whole season and training and obviously when we, we get on the line for the race. So. One more thing. I think Brenda makes a good point. For Americans, it's so – it's so nice in an off year <laughs> not to have it's to make like a team. It's like a mini world championship, <laughs> I feel like, uh, to make a, yeah. a, a team USA. So yeah. uh, US it's nice to do. Are, yeah, they're so yeah. cutthroat in the U.S. It's, it's so nice not to be facing that this year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one last question for Brenda and Jenny. Um, obviously, the NCAA championships are going on this weekend and some crazy performances coming out of there. Yeah. Um, you both managed to make the step up out of that sphere into the professional ranks. Is there any sort of advice you'd give the people who are running so well now to make the step to that next level in the coming months and years? Uh, to keep at it, you know, I think there's this culture in, in the U.S. Like, if you don't get a contract, a lot of athletes just end up dropping from the sport or they don't want to do it. Or, But um, I always encourage them to keep at it, trust the process, you know, do your research when either you're going into either staying with your coach or going into a league group. Um, but there's a lot of paths, I feel like, and opportunities in the U.S., and uh, I think it's just a matter of reaching out to these kids and knowing that you guys are still really young, and I always call them puppies, you know, so I've made mistakes in my career, and I've learned from them, but it's made me a better athlete as well, um, but there's a lot that goes into that, and, um, but yeah, I think that's just trying to encourage the next generation. I had such a wonderful college experience uh, and then had that those years of transitioning into becoming a pro. Um, my overwhelming advice to collegians would be, while you're in college, be the best collegian possible. That was the best thing for me, was that to really master where you are, um, especially with the availability and the access to elite athletes now. Uh, I think it's fun and it's tempting and it's there's a little bit of magic there to imagine what a pro life would be like, um, but I think they're best served to really focus on being the best collegian while they're there. And if that goes really well, then the, the pro transition will be there for them when they're ready. Thank you. And thank you. It sounds yep. like it's going to be a fun race tomorrow because all of you guys have said it's going to be fun. Yeah. So <laughs> looking forward for that, to that. Uh, please stand up, have some pictures here, and then we have a photo session just around the corner. Thank you. Was it just a, a pastime? Like, can you talk us through that um, a little? It was competitive, you know, we would have games. Um, my school would go against, would rival against other schools. And sometimes on the weekends, my family, my friends, my cousins, we all would play volleyball. We had a court where we live, so we all would play home as well. Yeah, almost every, every weekend I would play. And then talk us through that transition from volleyball to track and field. Like, what was it that started that? Um, was it something you were thinking about or was it someone said to you, you really should try this? Um, I was thinking about it. I competed one year um, at Bahamas Junior Champs. I didn't do so good, but I stayed with everybody. I, com I kept up with everybody in the race. So the next year I thought about just trying track and field and I wanted to be a sprinter, but my high school coach, he said I'm too tall, so he would try me in a quarter and here I am in the 400, <laughs> stuck.
And what kind of time were you running when you first started? Uh, my first 400 was 50.01. It hurt, but then like a month later, I ran 48. <laughs> cool. Uh, so it talks through those first few months. Like, what was it like doing all that training, coming from a volleyball background? Uh, it was hard. Um, we have we would have a lot of 450s to do, and I hated them. I only could do one. We had like five. I only could do one, but I would throw up every time. But he also put me to the side, and he just let me be finished for the day because I was done. Ah, uh, yeah, so our race is pretty good. You know, my coach. We talked together about our race, our race model, and. I executed it, but you know, it's all good. I felt really good during the race. But you know, after, everybody who knows me know that I would collapse, but I stayed strong. <laughs> I kind of like to have fun, but then still work hard because it's a job and if you don't like your job, you're not gonna perform well. So I, I would be the joker of the group. <laughs> so I saw you uh, in Doha in the, in the time between Shanghai and Doha, mm -hmm. and you were kind of there with your headphones on, dancing around a little bit. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that's just to get me in the mood for competing or for practice and I'll listen to music every day before I go on to practice. So training. you and Noah Lyle's gonna have a dance off at some point? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like rap music, you know, rap and pop music, my favorite. So have you got a favorite artist? Um, Rihanna, uh, Nicki Minaj, I'm um, Jay-Z, yeah.
Okay, all right. Uh, let's go for the next session. It's time to say hello to the big guys from <laughs> Discus. Uh, we uh, welcome Simon Pettersson, Daniel Stoll, and Mason Finley. I think. Up on stage and. Uh, I spoke a little bit Swedish as well. How's your Swedish, Mason? Bad. Is it bad? Yeah. Mm. You tell me about the train and, and someone in the speakers was, were speaking Swedish and you didn't understand anything. Uh, Why? Uh, not quite, no. <laughs> no yeah. It was hard. Yeah. Um, Sweden, Stockholm, how is it? It's great. Yeah, I love the weather. Uh, beautiful stadium. Can't wait to compete. Är det lika så med grabbarna bredvid? Jag tycker Can't wait. Precis. <laughs> då så, då sätter vi igång. Eh, Johan Storåkers finns också här med ett frågebatteri till er allihop. Okej, okay, we start with our guest, Mr. Finley. What can we expect from you? Uh, great discus profile at tomorrow's meeting. Um, hopefully big throws, you know, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> um, How far? Uh, really far. <laughs> <laughs> And what's that? Um, what do you want to go for? You want to know how far you want to throw? Like exact distance? Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> as far as I can, like between uh, hopefully over 65 all the way to 85, somewhere in there, you know? <laughs> like <laughs> do you have any special aims, ambitions for your own meeting tomorrow? Um, yeah, just throwing over 65, you know, hopefully try to get in the top three. Uh, what do you think about these Swedish uh, guys in oh. the discus, <laughs> Mr. Stahl and Mr. Pettersson? Uh, I love these guys, man. Uh, great competitors. Uh, very excited to compete with them. And it's going to be a good meet. And what do you think about the start list tomorrow at this IWF Diamond League meeting? It's very good. I mean, it mimics pretty much the, the final at Worlds, yeah. It's very close, so I mean, it's the best competition in the world. Uh, okay, we'll go to uh, Mr. Stoll. Can you tell us a little bit about your throwing at the Bislett Games in Oslo? The result, your technique, your feelings after Oslo? Yeah, I felt powerful at the meet and uh, much worse technically. But, but it's getting there. Uh, I threw 67 and uh, yeah, it felt pretty good. Good crowd and awesome people. Uh, you represent one of the organizing clubs here at Bowers Galan, the Sporwagens uh, Athletic Club. How will it be to compete tomorrow here on home ground with your friends here and so on? It's also uh, the old stadium for your favorite soccer team. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I mean, it's my hometown. I'm growing up here since yeah, when I was born. And like you said, my football team in Djurgården CF is from here also, and um, especially my track and field club, Sporvägen. So it's, yeah, it's very special. All my friends and all my yeah, families will come here and watch and scream. And yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, what can the world of athletics expect from the king of Järfälla tomorrow at the meeting? Well, they will see far throws and, yeah. How far? Really far, like Mason says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Mr. Pettersson, how was it to defeat your great friend and colleague, <laughs> Donald Stoll, at the competition earlier this spring? Um, yeah, it was really fun. I mean, I think it's, I think we both grow uh, from it, so I think it can be a, positive thing in the future. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your preparations uh, before Bauhaus Garland and your aims for tomorrow's meeting? Um, yeah, this is almost, I think this is the biggest meeting I've been at in my whole career, except Worlds. Um, so this, ha this is a little bit of my goal this season, to throw far tom tomorrow and to hopefully do a little bit better than I have this summer, so far. Uh, 
both you and uh, Mr. Stoll, uh, you're coached by the legend Westin Hafstenson. Can you tell us a little bit about his impact on your prog progression as an athlete? Uh, yes, I think I can thank him for everything I've done so far. I think if I haven't been with him, I shouldn't. I I don't think I've sh I have thrown as far as I have. Um, so he, I think he has everything to do with it. Uh, all his planning and all his like taking it step by step and not rushing anything. I think that's the key to throwing really far in the future. Uh, at your first appearance in the Swedish senior national team, you did qualify for the final at the World <coughs> Cup Championships in London. What can we expect from <laughs> Simon Pettersson this summer, here and the Europeans and so on? Um, yeah, I really hit a good one in last year in the Worlds. So I really hope I can hit a similar one this year. Um, I hope to be a little bit more consistent than I was have been so far this year, and um, but it feels like it's coming along, like day by day, and just a couple more, a little better meets, and I think I'm gonna be ready for Europeans and hopefully do good there. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Any questions from the floor? Uh, Mason, last year when you won the medal in London, obviously surprised a lot of people, but I think it was 18 years since there was an American uh, medal in the discus. Um, just wondering what effect you think that might have on other American throwers. Obviously, I suppose America is all dominant on the track, not so much in the throws, but do you think that maybe you might inspire others to try and step up and achieve what you did last year? I really hope so. Yeah, I think um, especially for the younger generation, um, Seeing like a American get a medal again, and like you said, it's been so long. Um, I hope it kind of brings, you know, breathes life into the discus again. Hopefully, at a younger generation that can come up, and you know, and even the current one now. I mean, they're they're doing pretty well, and um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, just one quick question as well. I asked uh, Jenny Simpson and Brenda Martin, "Is this the NCAA championships are on this weekend?" And obviously, some crazy performances coming out of there. You managed to make the step up and succeed at professional level and reach this Diamond League circuit. What advice would you give to other youngsters to try and stay the course throughout their 20s and make it here? Like post-collegiately? Yeah. yeah. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, try to find a place where you can train easily, um, where it's not, um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to find like a facility and <laughs> stuff like that. So. Um, once you find that and just uh, no matter like what adversity comes or you know just remember that you're doing this because you love it and you know the distances or the times will come eventually yeah and while I have the mic I'll just put a quick question to our Swedish throwers um, to Daniel and Simon competing in front of home crowd can be a blessing and a curse depending on the person um, how do you feel going out there? Is it, do you feel a little bit more nervous or is it more excitement when you're coming out in front of a packed stadium of your own fans? I think it's going to be real fun. I heard that it's going to be almost outsold too, so I think it's going to be a really good, good night. Yeah, it's going to be great, really fun. The king is going to watch and all the politicians and uh, everybody. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be awesome. Thank you. A question for Daniel, thank you. Uh, so you were fourth in Rome, third in Oslo. Uh, you obviously have a fantastic field uh, that you're up against tomorrow. Are you confident of improving upon your, your best Diamond League performance so far this year? What did you say in the end? Uh, so uh, a fourth and a third place so far in the Diamond League competitions. Mm. Uh, despite a very strong field, uh, tomorrow, are you confident of improving uh, maybe second or even first place tomorrow? Yes, I think, yeah. It feels pretty good. Uh, I feel pretty powerful right now. and So I'm ready for tomorrow. It's going to be fun. But uh, I'm going to try to do my best and throw as far as I can. Another question for Mason. Um, I was reading that you, you lost, I think, something like 100 pounds at one stage of your career. Um, just wondering how kind of that came about and, and how... As a discus thrower, do you find the right balance between, I suppose, bulk and size and 
avoid going too much bulk and too much size. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, when I get to college, I try to put on as much weight as I could and just watching like YouTube videos from the, you know, 1970s. I was like, I got to get big like them. And, uh, I got a little too big, and <laughs> so I uh, couldn't move really well. Um, but, I mean, I could lift a lot of weight, so I just couldn't move very well in the circle. And so I uh, just started reading up on nutrition, like finding out, like, what I was putting in my body. And um, over the course, I think it was, like, three years, I lost uh, over 100 pounds and um, just kind of uh, adapted my training to more speed, more flexibility, stuff like that. And, um, still have a little ways to go, but... Uh, you know, just uh, it's trial and error mostly. Yeah. Any further questions? In that case, we just say good luck tomorrow, guys. What a lineup we got. We got you three here, and uh, tomorrow, even more guys on uh, the field. So uh, please stand up, or maybe they are going to sit. I don't stand up, okay? and uh, pose with a diamond. I thought when I've been thinking about becoming world champion when I was younger, I'm thinking like, now you have done it, now you can just sit back and enjoy life, you know? And, and that becoming a world champion gives you the privilege to, to, to go on vacations and, and just relax because now you are on the top level. Um, but <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't the truth after all because now I just, I just want more. I want to train more, I want to perform even better and and, and I'm even, even more hungry now than I was before. So the feeling of being a world champion was, was, was a totally different one than I, than I expected. But, um, but I think it's positive that it's that way. And um, 
and I really like my days now and the days after the World Championships have been, have been perfect. You know what, firstly we, we decided not to, not to have a party like most, like most other do when they win the World Championships. But, uh, but I wanted to, to take some time with, uh, with my coach just to sit back and drink a Coke and, and just talk about all the things that we have done coming into these championships and, and all the work that we have done. And at the same time, I was, of course, full of adrenaline and, and happiness. So, so it was kind of like a cloud nine feeling, but, uh, but I didn't sleep. No, I did not. So we, we just stay awake until the breakfast and then we just ate some breakfast and then we walked, walked in, the, in the streets of London and yeah, then we managed to get some sleep in, in the middle of the day, the day after.
the next session that focus on uh, Nordic running or something. <laughs> because it's a great lineup with uh, Lovisa Lind, Kerstin Warholm, Warholm and uh, Andreas Kramer. Welcome up. Hej och välkomna. Tack. Känns det bra att vara här? Väldigt. Feels good to be here. Okay. Um, when did you get here? To Stockholm? Oh, last night. Mm -hmm. The train took forever. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're here now. We're very uh, happy and thankful for that. Uh, Johan Storokers is also with me uh, with some questions for you. We do it in English. Uh, if we have any Swedish questions, of course, let us know and we translate for you. Okay, thank you very much. We start with Lovisa. Tell us a little bit about your race at the Bis Bislet Games in Oslo. Um, yeah, it was my first 800 in a year and uh, <coughs> my plan was to start a bit slow and uh, just try to do my own race and uh, yeah, I'm happy I, I took the qualification time in my first uh, first race, so yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay, and Karsten, our guest from Norway, please tell us about your great races in Rome for the 782 and Nordic record, and also about your thoughts from the race in Oslo. Um, I was very happy about starting off my season with uh, with uh, a personal record and a Nordic record. Um, it was very fun to run under 48. Um, that was my goal for the year, and I achieved it in the first race. Um, was of course hoping to to improve even more at Bislet, but uh, that's the game, you know. Um, you can't improve in every race, um, and I see that I still have a, have a lot lot of things to work with, and uh, I just need to take that with me. Okay, Andreas, you did run a great 800 meters race in the meeting in Hengelo, marvelous one for the 538, almost a new Swedish record your own from Karlstad last year. Please tell us about the race in uh, Hengelo. Yeah, the, r the race was good for me, but it wasn't uh, what I wanted. I, I wanted like a more clean run. Uh, I had a good run, uh, good runners uh, to meet, and then I had 145.38, and yeah, it was a good time, good season opener, so better than I thought. And But I, I think I can do better if I have some more races. So maybe tomorrow I, ha I will have a good thousand meters. Uh, okay, Luisa, how have you worked uh, together with your team to recover from your injuries? Um, yeah, I had an injury in the <coughs> end of last season and then, yeah, as always, it's uh, rehab and then try to do everything uh, apart from running, like cross training and everything. And then it's just taking one step at a time to, uh, to get back in as good shape as possible to this season. Uh, Karsten, can you inform us about your very <coughs> successful cooperation with the legendary Norwegian sprint coach Leif Olaf Aldnes? Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to, to tell you about him. Um, I started to train with him in 2015. Um, Leif Olaf is a, is a very well-known coach in in the Norwegian track and field environment. Um, he has trained a lot of fast people and have a lot of medals. Um, so I was really happy that I, because I asked him and uh, he had to think about it for a while and, and he said I was a nice guy. So he, he wanted to he wanted to do it one last time before he died, he said. So I don't know, um, he's, he's brilliant. Um, happy to work with him every day and, and we have so much fun, you know. Um, we use a lot of time on this. Uh, we train extremely hard, and uh, then it's and then it's very very okay to have someone that you that you can communicate very well with, and uh, and that you can have have a lot of fun with. So uh, so he is um, yeah he is extremely good to have, and uh, and he is a lot of the explanation behind my my sports sport success. Yeah, uh, Andreas, <coughs> the Swedish record at uh, thousand meters is two seventeen sixty seven. Will that record survive tomorrow? 
I guess we will see tomorrow. The it's a good record by by Joan. So I know it's uh, I know I can be in do the time like two seventeen or something. But yeah, we will see tomorrow. I don't think about it too much. <laughs> Okay, Louisa, what are your aims for Bauer Scaland and also the rest of the season, including Berlin and the Europeans? Yeah, no, we we don't really have a plan after after this race. I'll I'll do tomorrow as good as possible and then, then we'll see what, what's coming up next. Um my goal for this weekend with Oslo and Stockholm was to take the qualification time and now I did uh, in Oslo. So I'll just hope to run a little bit quicker tomorrow and then, then we'll see. Uh, Karsten, now you are here at the famous Stockholm Olympic Stadium. What can we expect from you tomorrow? The world champion. <laughs> A lot of pressure. Um, you know, I, I always like uh, coming here because I always competed here just, just a few years ago at the Bauhaus Gala Youth. And, um, and I always like coming here. It was, it was big for me. And uh, now I'm here in, in, in the Diamond Leagues. And, uh, and of course, that's, that's a big deal. Um, so I'm hoping to run fast. As you can see, every race I'm I'm just laying on the ground and waiting to die, and I'm probably going to do so tomorrow as well. Uh, Andreas, you're now at the top European level. What do you have uh, for aims, ambitions for the Europeans in Berlin and the season? Yeah, it's uh, two months to go to Berlin, so now it's just focus on. Yeah, the next race that is tomorrow, and then I have some more races before Berlin. But yeah, I think I can do good at the Europeans, but it's it's a long long way to go. Okay, any questions from the floor? Uh, Karsten, you and uh, Abdirahman have had the little trilogy of rivalry over the last few meetings as well. This will be the third in a space of a week or 10 days. Um, just wondering how him showing up on the scene, running as fast as he does, has maybe has it affected you at all? Has it changed your mindset going into a race when you know he's two lanes inside you or wherever he is? Um, for me, I always choose to have an outer lane uh, because, because I feel like running more, uh, more on, the, on the outside because the, the turns are, are more soft, if that's, if that's a way to explain it. But, but of course, it, it does something about your mindset. Um, I like to win, that no doubt about it. But uh, but of course, I, I see that he, that he is running extremely fast, and uh, and um, now I just have to chase him, you know, um, have to have to make a plan and, and try to do the best as I can. And and he runs incredibly incredibly fast, and uh, and um, all respect to that, you know, it's it's a hard event, and um, and he does it perfectly. So so for me now, I just have to have to try to improve, and and it looks good now, and um, now he's better than me, so. We just have to see, you know, I, it's hard to do anything. I just have to have to run. <laughs> and I have to ask as well, did you wake up to the news and watch uh, Rye Benjamins win at the NCAAs like most people this morning? Yeah, yeah I had talk? nightmares, man. <laughs> uh, could I ask another question to Andreas? Just wondering, obviously you've run a lot of 800 meters uh, and it's a 1K tomorrow. Um, how do you approach that differently? Does it sort of having a distance so rarely run, how do you go about pacing yourself properly? Yeah, I hope the, the other ones want to run fast because I want to. Uh, I run it, I think, two times before, but it was some years ago. So I hope to do yeah, a, new, a good personal best. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think I will manage to do 200 more, 200 meters more. I think I will do good. And one more quick one for Karsten. Um, the other night again in Oslo, we saw you sort of waving your hands on the start line, rousing up the home crowd. Do you think that's something that's very important for at that the athletes should do to, I suppose, let their personality shine on the track to give the fans a good show? I don't know. It's it's with athletes as the same as as every human being in life. Um, we are different, and um, and I think maybe thousands of Carsons would be too much. <laughs> But um, but you know I was I was was at home and and I wanted the um, the um, the settings to be to be perfect and I wanted to to fire up the crowd and and to and to have just just this perfect moment and uh, and it almost was you know there is just there was one man uh, one man in front of me and the second place was was good but um, yeah the the 
then the what do you call it? The people in the stands, they were they were perfect. And a quick one for Lavisa. Um, coming into a European Championship year, are, are you extra motivated, I guess, given what you achieved in 2016 and obviously off the back of injuries that you could be able to get back on that podium again? Yeah, of course I have. have you been up there once, you want to go back. And um, yeah, I'll just try my best to be in, uh, in even better shape in, in August for Berlin. And what were the injuries that you mentioned previously? Uh, I had a stress <laughs> reaction in my foot right before Wells last year. Okay, any further questions? If we not have, please stand up. We have a short photo session here and then we go ahead with another one and one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews around the corner. Hey there, my name is Sam Kendricks. I'm the 2017 World Outdoor Champion in the Men's Pole Vault. And I'm here today to show you a little bit about the event and how to do it. Now I have with us three props to illustrate the three really important parts of the pole vault because it's a really complicated event. This is a tape measure and I'm gonna use this to show you how we do our run up in the event, just like a long jumper. Next, we're gonna use this bungee as I walk you through how the whole standard system works and whatnot, and how we make these uh, adjustments on the fly. And last, and hopefully not most complicated, we have the pole. And it's near and dear to every pole vaulter's heart is how these poles interact with us. So let's get started. Right, the first part of the vault is the run, and arguably the most important any vaulter has to accomplish every day. We use something like a tape measure to measure each individual step that is gonna lead us up to a successful vault. The most important aspect of our event is speed. So the faster athlete is always gonna have an advantage right off the bat. Now the run can be affected by many things. The condition of the track, the conditions of the wind, or even the conditions of the crowd when your adrenaline is pumping and you are running faster than you do in training. So we have to take all these things into account when determining our best run up to give us the best chance of success when it comes to clearing that high bar. All right. So every pole vaulter has to use the same runway, but we use it in different ways. This tape measure shows us exactly where we need to step on the runway, and it becomes a math problem how to get us in the air. Every pole vaulter's numbers are different, and during each competition, this tape measure is laid on the ground and stretched out so that we can all make adjustments on the fly. One of the most crucial parts of our event is the jump itself, and many, many details go into this, and every vaulter does it differently. Now, an important piece of equipment is the bungee or bar. We use this to illustrate the obstacle above us that we're aiming for every jump. Now these uprights move forward and back and then put the bar when it's up in competition in different places. Now I want you to watch for this in the next competition you watch. If a vaulter then falls on top of the bar and springs it loose, he might make one or two adjustments. He might go to a stiffer pole or he might just simply move the standards closer out of his way and try to do it the same way. Now we are constantly balancing the risks and the advantages of every decision we make in the pole vault. So if you hear a number uh, being shouted over the live stream like 50 centimeters or 80 centimeters, that is actually the, the direction that the standard is moving so that I can place the bar what is best for me. Near and dear to every pole vaulter's heart are their collection of vaulting poles. You can think of them like golfing clubs. Now each pole is different and they do a different job. Um, and if you can look at these numbers at the top, they all illustrate something different for every pole vaulter. Whether it be the length or the stiffness, every pole vaulter is going to jump differently because of it. Now this is a plant box and we use this pole while running down the runway to stop the pole from moving so that we can translate our momentum into the pole and rise above it to clear an obstacle. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through the really complicated movement of the vault, where it starts and then where it finishes. Every vaulter is gonna start with the pole held in his hands like this. They carry it this way because it's lighter. As we run down the runway and pick up speed, every vaulter is focusing on how he's gonna plant this pole in the box. As we rise around, we plant the pole in the box, translating all of that run energy into the pole itself, 
bending it in many cases, and rising upward. But you have to make sure to keep this pole moving forward, else you land somewhere else that's not the nice soft landing zone over there. All right, so I'm gonna explain the crucial rules of the event so you can wrap your head around what you're seeing. Every vaulter at the beginning of the competition has one minute when the time clock starts to when he has to clear that bar. So we all have to make our adjustments in between. Every jumper gets three attempts to clear a bar. Now, it gets interesting when a vaulter may miss and another vaulter may clear the bar and it comes down to a decision. Does the vaulter then take his remaining two attempts to the next bar or continue to jump so he can get back those three full attempts? You have three attempts to make a bar, remember that. If you miss three in a row, you're out at whatever height. And the bar never comes down, it only gets higher. Hello, my name is Lubo Manyonga. Today I'm gonna do some run-ups, just check how run-up is doing, and welcome to Trading Diaries.
Well, most of the time, when I go to sleep, I struggle to sleep. I have this vision all the time, like, hey, when I jump over nine meters, what's going to happen? When I jump over nine meters, how I'm going to land? When I jump over nine meters, what's going to happen in, in that um, environment? I mean, how's going to be the, 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 the expression of the people, like, seeing the first guy jump nine meters? Like, I really struggle at night to sleep because I think about it and think over and over and over again. And I see myself floating to nine meters. Sometimes I do dream about it. Yeah. I want to clear nine meters. I want to be the first guy who jump over nine meters. And it's going to happen before I die. Look at the height he gets off the ball. That's super technique too. Controls the rotations beautifully. Look at that. Yes. Okay, three new gentlemen taking place here. <laughs> and it was not that easy because I said to them, take it a little bit easy. I will tell you, I will say your names and then you can come and then just jump on the podium here. So I think, yeah, it's you guys. Yes. A little bit jump focus here now uh, from, uh, from now on and a couple of minutes uh, forward and uh, no rush. no rush, okay, yeah, Same good. Right. A lot of competitions right now. Yeah. Need some rest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How, how's Stockholm so far? I've been here one hour. Yeah. <laughs> so? <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful and sunny. I wish it would be like this tomorrow. It is, I promise you. Okay, cool. Yeah. So Are the conditions. Are you promising about wind? Oh, windy, yeah. Exactly. Tomorrow it's gone, okay? Are you sure? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check it out for you. Thank you. Welcome, guys. Yeah, we'll start up with uh, my colleague, uh, Joan Sturokes. She's also here with some questions for you guys. We start up from now. Cool. Uh, Let's go. Okay, Luvu, please tell us about your great jumping, including the world best mark of 
uh, 58 at the IWF Diamond League meeting in Rome? Um, at the moment, I'm, st I'm still having a good season, and I'm quite excited about the season. And uh, it feels like it's only the beginning of the season now. Also having the, the arrival of the kid from, from Cuba that is giving me so, so much tough time at the moment. Uh, it's not like uh, last year I was jumping alone, but this year it's quite an uh, intensive competition. Okay, Sam, uh, you did win in the IWF Diamond League in Rome with a result of 583. Please tell us a little bit about your performance in the uh, capital of Italy. Well, when I jumped 584 in Rome, uh, I looked around right before I took my attempt, and it's always funny to go after the crowd has watched Luvo. Um, so right after he had jumped his world-leading mark was when I had to step on the track and then jump my jump. Uh, so the crowd had already cheered their cheer, and so that was just kind of extra, I guess. <laughs> Um, so when I jumped 84, I was so excited because it was a third attempt jump for me, uh, my best jump of the year by one centimeter. And it's always a, a real special feeling when you can come across the world from the other side of America all the way to Central Europe and say, okay, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not what I thought I was. I did not have my best performance in Shanghai. Luvo, even in the rain, had an awesome performance in Shanghai. I could not match it. Um, and so I said, I need to really learn from this and come to each competition treating it like a championship because we as Americans don't really have a huge championship this year. So I treat every competition like a championship. So it was really exciting for me. Uh, Tobias, uh, you have a great cooperation with the famous coach, Yannick Tregaro. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, work with your uh, career in the long jump? Yeah, it starts uh, this year in uh, January. I talked to him about a uh, new option because I was in college in the USA. Um, and uh, I didn't want to like be there anymore, so come home again and uh, start a new coach back here. And uh, yeah, Janik was the best option for that. Uh, Luvo, uh, the stadium record at this famous Stockholm Olympic Stadium is 859. It's from 1997 and uh, achieved by the great legend from Cuba, Ivan Pedroso. Will that stadium record survive tomorrow's competition? Um, like as we're jumping at the moment, um, quite honest that the record is at risk, you know. The way we're pushing each other in long jump, like 858, 853. So we have, we have a good shot for tomorrow. To, to take that record away because it's been here for a long time. I think we need something new, like for the new generations. You know, yeah, I think tomorrow depends on the condition of the weather. I hope uh, everything goes well tomorrow and the record is going. Uh, Sam, at the uh, 24th of June last year, you gained admission to a very exclusive club, the Six Meters Club. Uh, what can we expect from you, a pole vault profile, tomorrow here in Stockholm? Well, first off, I love how he phrases his questions with so much drama. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, six meters is a benchmark. Just, just like I'm sure Luvo has a benchmark that he feels is admission to kind of the world club of, hey, you're doing this right. Um, you know, so many different things come to pass in this sport and are con counted great at different times and different generations. Um, the stadium record here is 5 meters 95, a very tall mark. I I've only matched it in competition on two occasions. And doing something like that is not something you say, I can do all the time. It takes a maximum effort. It takes a little bit of luck. And it takes some perfection that you can't always wield day to day. Um, and any high-level competitor understands that. It says, I can't be perfect every day. But this is a competition. It's not about being perfect. It's about going for the win. Um, I watched little Mondo Duplantis' interview yesterday. He says, 
it's probably a good day to jump six meters, and I hope he goes for it because I'll be chasing him all the way up there. Yep. Uh, he's got home field advantage, I think, right now, so it's going to be a good competition. Six meters is something – I'm on the same poles that I jumped six meters on last year. You're waiting for those great conditions in the vault, and Luvo was asking about the wind today. It does make a big difference. When you can add that extra 1% onto what you've – mastered in the past to make something magical happen and six meters is kind of that magical thing not many guys have done it um tobias uh, your best result this outdoor season is if i don't miss any mark seven seven to six from the beginning of june in spain uh, what are your aims ambitions for tomorrow here in a start uh, list with a lot of world-class jumpers yeah, it's a really good competition tomorrow, uh, like Luva here, you know, 8.58, right? Yeah. Yeah, and um, so hopefully I can do the 8 meters tomorrow again. My personal best is 8.04, so yeah, hopefully around that would be great. Um, Luvo, it's a year with no uh, world champs or Olympic games. What ambitions do you have at the IWF Diamond League and other competitions and marks? Um, basically, this year I have uh, two major competitions like international. I have African Champs and Continental Cup. So basically, I'm just focusing on staying healthy and just perform and also break my personal best because it's been standing here for a long time. I think I need something new this year. And I'm not uh, also um, rushing myself to do that. It's gonna come like uh, naturally as my personal best came naturally. Look, I don't wanna push myself. Maybe tomorrow is the day, maybe not tomorrow, maybe the other day. So let's just be patient. Uh, okay, Sam, what do you think about our great talent Armand Mondo de Plantis, the world junior record holder. Well, I can certainly tell you he's a lot better than ping, at ping pong than I am. Um, I don't think I've ever beaten him. <laughs> but I can tell you that there is a fire of competition that is often not seen uh, with young competitors. I can tell you that one thing that makes Mondo so great is that he has seen firsthand uh, the people that have come before him and what struggles they've gone through and what's made them great. He's got a great father and a great coach, and I think that's 90% of the battle is having a great mentor in this sport of pole vaulting. Um, anytime Greg travels with Mondo, I want to be at the dinner table with those guys because it's going to be a fun time. They're talking baseball. They're talking pole vault nomenclature like I've never heard before. I feel like a novice when I'm going talking some Cajun Swedish pole vault terms with those guys. Uh, it's, it's way over my head most of the time. Uh, but when I compete against him, you know, I get the feeling he's kind of gunning for me sometimes, and I, I respect that. It's really cool. Uh, he kind of throws it over the top occasionally, but, I, man, I respect the hell out of him as a competitor because he expects the most from himself. Now, you asked Luvo a second ago, this is not a year of championships for guys like me and him. He was the champion of the Eden Gold Coast this year. But we have matched our medals, gold last year and silver indoors this year. <laughs> so I think we've staked our claim uh, for being recurring champions this year around again. And the nature of a year like this is, like Luvo said, a chance to go beyond. Uh, rather than just stay at home and rest for the championship, I've been on the road for the last three weeks trying to jump in new places and experience and go for meet records and jump with new people. And it's not every year I get the chance to do that. So when we come here, I have a little, a little uh, expectation in my, in my hip pocket that's uh, to go wherever the leader takes the day. And it's not every day you get to be the leader in the pole vault. Now, because I'm world champion, I might be at the end of the list. But like I saw at Prefontaine Classic this year, that Mondo can certainly put the pressure on a competition from the front. And I've had to do that in the past before. And I can see a little bit of myself in him. So when it comes down to competition tomorrow, I don't think his eyes are at the first few bars, they're at the last few bars. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to respect about that. 
Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? <coughs> a question for Sam. You obviously competed at the Rio Olympics where it was a difficult atmosphere for anyone who wasn't Brazilian and now you're coming to Sweden where I guess the crowd isn't going to be cheering against you but they're certainly going to be cheering for someone else. Um, how does that affect you as a jumper, your mentality during a competition as opposed to say 10 days ago in Eugene where you know the whole crowd wants you to win versus coming here where kind of they want you to lose? <laughs> well, you know, it's... Uh I don't know. I don't know if you got that spot on just quite. Uh, if you go onto my social media pages, you'll see that about 30% of my followers are Brazilian. <laughs> so uh, I have a, a huge following down in Brazil, and more and more each year do I get invitations to come back to Rio and to to compete in that area and to meet the people from that zone. Uh, it is a it's a football nation, you know, and they they cheer and they have a different mindset of sport. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone knows the stories of how the, the Olympic final went in 2016. I was lucky to be a part of it. I really was. I was lucky to come away with a medal, and I was lucky to be part of one of the grandest competitions in history. Um, I c you can only count those on one hand in a career. But when it comes to this kind of year and uh, where you're competing, not every place can be like London where it's kind of no man's land. I speak English, everyone wants to cheer for the English-speaking guy, sure, and that's not really how the sport goes. This sport goes for, we want to see what comes next. It may not be me, it may not be Armand, Mondo, uh, but it'll be somebody that is great in the event, that kind of sets the stage. Maybe it was me being undefeated last year, maybe it'll be me going not undefeated this year, that makes everything mixed up. It's not necessarily about nationality. If you want to look at it that way, Mondo's down lives down the street from me. He doesn't live in Sweden. Um, and so I think that the people in this crowd may not just be cheering for Mondo. They may be cheering for a great competition because that's what we all want to see. Uh, I think in Oregon, they were just as big of fans of Mondo as they were of me because uh, those people were track fans out there. That, I suppose one of the great greatest things about the sport relative to... I don't know, your foot, your soccer and other sports like basketball where it is quite hostile, where in general in our sport it's quite supportive regardless of your nationality. Well, it, you, this is a, uh, a gentleman's game, I think, track and field. It's not so much man-to-man -man coverage uh, as it is in a lot of sports. My enemy is not Mondo. My enemy is the, the trial in front of me, the obstacle there, the pole vault. You raise the bar and you jump over it. That's just the essence of the event. It doesn't put me at odds with Mondo. It shows me how much better I can be than myself. And if my best day is better than Mondo's best day or vice versa, that's the nature of this kind of competition. And we can all, I think, grasp that a little better than, Mondo, I want to jump better than you because I want to be better than you. That doesn't. That doesn't sell a competition. Nobody wants to see me battling an 18-year-old over who wants to be the best pole vaulter today. The they want to say, okay, how are these guys going to work together to jump the highest bar? It's something that might not have been done before. It's kind of the bridging of two generations. Uh, I think when we go next time, Renault, Mondo, and myself compete together, you kind of are going to see three generations of pole vaulters uh, jumping together. So that's kind of cool. Question for Sam and Luvo, thank you. Uh, Sam, uh, please tell us what on earth happened on your journey here and, and how you're feeling. And afterwards, please, Luvo, um, could you please explain to us how you found it um, starting your, your outdoor season so early in the Gold Coast and whether you had a break afterwards and ab about your training since? Well, I think you've heard me talk enough for a few minutes, so uh, <laughs> let's let Luvo go after this one first. Oh. Uh. After the Gold Coast, um, <coughs> uh, I took a break, uh, uh, two weeks, but I was well, not um, completely a break. I was training, and I uh, decided that uh, Commonwealth was one of my bucket lists that I wanted to, to achieve, was my goal. And um, after that, I decided, oh, Luvo, you have to, to maintain your, your streak of un undefeated. And also, there was a... Also, another, another long jump is the jumping over 8.40, and I was no more a world lead after I saw Jeff Henderson jump 8.40, and that <laughs> gave me a fright that what's going on now? I have to pull up my socks and 
with a chat with my coach, and then I just talk about, no, you just have to just focus on myself and you not know, think of anyone else who, who is jumping far. Because as he says, it's the gentleman um, game, you know, you don't have to, to focus on anyone else but yourself because on that runway, you're on your own. It doesn't matter how far the other guy jumps, you have to jump your own jump. Yeah, yeah Luvo's a damn good jumper, so uh, I think he's always going to believe in himself too. You know, my trip here is uh, one that could have been easily avoided if I wasn't searching for competition. Uh, I've competed, I guess, nine times in the last month, and for different types of athletes, that might be a lot of different, a lot of competition. But for a vaulter in a year that's not a championship necessarily, a global championship even anymore, besides world indoors, it gives me the chance to go to to earn that living as an athlete to experience new places, like I was saying earlier. And I didn't have to compete in Germany last night. And it might have made it easier to compete here tomorrow, but then I would have never competed in Dessau, Germany. I would have never had a cappuccino with my friend Tobias on the street corner. And uh, that's the nature of the sport is there's, there's a lot of things to be missed and a lot of things to be gained. And sometimes you have to put yourself on trial. And just like Luvo says, he was having a conversation with his coach about saying, well, I'm not the world lead. I haven't been the world lead all year. And that doesn't mean you can't win competitions. I don't think any world lead was set in a competition that I was in that I wasn't privy to. Um, Renault had to come all the way to Texas to jump 595, and he jumps 591 in Poland. Great jumpers are all over the place. Great jumpers are all over the place. But we have to come together. And I saw Jeff Henderson at lunch today, and uh, he's coming here to jump against Luvo, and I'm coming here to jump against Mondo. And that's just how it goes. <laughs> okay, one last question. A uh, question for Luvo. Um, we've obviously seen your championship mentality in London and Rio, many other places. Um, last week in Rome, we saw it again when Juan Miguel Echeverria jumped, eight, I think it was 8.53, and you immediately responded with 8.58. Do you kind of feed off the adrenaline in that situation to try and find something extra? Does it give you something more when you're taken to the runway, when someone else has stepped up and popped yeah. a huge one? <coughs> it quite gave me a um, uh, hype, you know, because... You know, I, I don't like to be left behind, you know, <laughs> because I know how, um, how far I can I can jump, how, cap how much capable I can go. You know, when the competition is start to be intense, that way I feed off, you know. I like to respond, you know, make the competition so hype. And like to change the game, you know. It's been a long time having, like, two jumpers in one competition going o over 850. <clears throat> so it also makes the, the sport grow, you know, like getting, um, entertaining the, the fans, you know, it's quite exciting. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you. You have definitely made uh, a great performance before today, uh, tomorrow's uh, um, Diamond League game here, uh, Diamond League at uh, the Olympic Stadium in Stockholm. Can Welcome, we, uh, we can't wait, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Do you have any words left? You cutting us off, Patrick? Yeah, Are I do. Done? Because you have, you have one and ones as well, <laughs> so I want you to save some words. <laughs> okay. okay. Is that okay for you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Sam. Thank okay. You. Um, please stand up and have a short photo shoot here, and then we have more photo shoot around the corner. Thank you guys for coming, oh, and good luck tomorrow. Hey there, my name is Sam Kendricks, and this is... I am Mondo Duplantis. And we're here to play How Well Do You Know Me at the Athletissima meeting in Lausanne, Switzerland. We're really excited to be here. <laughs> All right, so the first question. What we're going to do is I'm going to pick up a question, and I'm going to ask Mondo to answer, like, for me. And then I'll put the correct answer on my sheet here, and he'll see if our answers match. And then the next we switch it up. And the next we switch out, right? So if we come up with the same answer, it's all good. That means uh, Mondo knows me better than I thought. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll see. All right. The first question, where is my dream place to live? It should be easy. Okay, in three, two, one, go. 
Yeah, we got it right, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought he'd be Oxford. <laughs> yeah, my hometown is in Oxford, Mississippi, so Mono knows me pretty well. He, he knows just, how to... He looks like an Oxford boy, when he, especially when he talks, dude. He's just an Oxford boy. Yeah, he I don't really want to leave either, so... Uh, yeah, he doesn't you know, see Lausanne's it. a great place, but I, don't, I think I'll only vacation <laughs> here, for sure. <laughs> All right, we're going to move to the next one. Wait, it's Mono's turn. So I do it. Okay. What am I most proud of? <laughs> Oh, this is a rough one, okay? So does, do I say his brother? Do I say his pole vaulting? Do I say his, his can I give a score? Can I give a subject or no? Yeah, this like, is what if I wild. said, like, yeah, okay. pole vaulting? What am I most proud of? No? No. That's too, that's too specific. Wait, okay. Okay. I have to guess it. Okay. All right, that's it. What is he most proud of? All right. Three. Two, one. What'd you put? Gold at World Youth Championships, and I put, uh, he's most proud of his own style. High school, st what do you mean by his, high school style? Your style, man. You, you have a wrong, your own kind of style in the event. You realize that? Like what I wear? Or like no, what I, I do? I jump, man. Oh. He can no. jump, okay, I don't know if you know this, but Mondo can jump like any other jumper in the world. He could do my technique not if like I asked him. him. Not quite like him, no. He could do Renault's technique if you asked him. He could jump straight ball, he can do it all. But he does it exactly how he wants to do it, not like anybody else. So I thought he is what he was most proud of. You can do that, can't you? I, I can't, but see, the like, I, I didn't really think that like kind of vague. I oh. kind of thought like, uh, since I don't like the records are like cool, but like I think one of like my first like actual medal yeah. is something that you can't like take away a medal. You can, I mean, you can break a yeah, record. You can break a record, but you can't like break them up. Unless you drop it, you can't. You can't break your record. <laughs> you can't break well, your medal. Well, I mean, medal. the medal I'm most proud of is my first medal at the state meet in Mississippi. I got a bronze. Yeah. It's, it mirrors my last championship medal, oh, cool. you know, which is pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah. So I know a little bit more about it now. All right, so yeah. it's my turn. <laughs> All right, so you got to rip it off. Okay, I already did. Oh, I'm just. I'm not. Rip, I mean, I could. <laughs> what was my worst subject in school? <laughs> All right, so Mondo and I might be considered jocks, but I actually studied pretty hard. So we'll see if he gets this. What's my worst subject? Uh, okay. Like, uh, are we gonna do like the the common the common yeah. common four? Yeah. All right. Uh, kind of just like the generic one to put, I guess. Uh. He sounds like he's writing too much for it to be. Uh, the no, 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 no. Uh, like uh. Okay, three, two, one, go. What'd you put? Math. <laughs> See, no, that's that the English. That is what I. That was what I last was gonna put. English. <laughs> literature. English literature. Yeah. That was my worst subject easily. That oh. was. Oh my God. Well, I'm when so I was in thing. school, you know, it was all about jumping, and I was actually decent at math. But now that I'm, now that I'm a professional, you know, I have time to read a lot more, and yeah. time on the road to spend on my. My handwriting and my grammar and things like that, you know, writing sure. letters to fans and whatnot. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't. I didn't have not, any reason not, for it in not, school. I don't, I t I'm terrible at writing funny. too. All right. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. We've only got one right so far. I gotta know Mondo a little better. Come on, ask me about his FIFA team or something. <laughs> ask me about his, uh, his brother in baseball if, or something. If I had a superpower, what would it be? He's already a superhero, look at him. He's no. already flying through the air. Uh, if he had a superpower, what would it be? It would be, Ah, uh, shoot. I wrote it. He got, he's got to be able to fly, man. Speed? Ah. Uh, I want it like super, like super, super fast. Like, like the flash <laughs> or like That's Quicksilver? Kinda... The flash of Quicksilver. Or not that fast. Who's Quicksilver? I don't even know Quicksilver. Quicksilver. Marvel, man. Yeah, you know. Marvel, man. You know, he, you know, he got, got it from Kick-Ass, I might be too, yeah. In the Avengers? Age of Ultron. No, I never, I never, I never seen that. I never seen that. Oh, we gotta get you. All right, we're gonna get him some more movie watching on the road, okay? When he's traveling, uh, I'm gonna bring the movies. We're gonna watch. Fly. It. Yeah, I guess that would have probably been the that'd probably been the better one. Fly, probably should. have. <laughs> but you can already fly. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. He can already fly. It's just like, well, maybe he want to fly higher so those records would be high. even easier. Exactly. All right, it's your turn. I just. Oh, yeah. What's yeah. your favorite superhero? Superpower. Oxford. Yeah. Who's my biggest model role model? Who's my biggest role model? I would, I would bet. Oh, all right, I don't know if I want to bet a hundred dollars, but I would bet money I get this one right. Uh, <laughs> dang. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
No. <laughs> 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 Meaning his dad, not my dad. <laughs> His his dad. Oh yeah, well that's that's probably right. You know, that's my probably, father, my coach. I, think, I, I was think trying to make a joke. Got that right, yeah. yeah, he got that one right. I really did. My yeah. old man is a uh, is my coach, and you know he's my cowboy, he's my bodyguard. He travels that, with me everywhere. Oh yeah. I thought I thought Mono was gonna put me on there, so I had to put my. <laughs> we gotta get more right, man. We gotta get more right. <laughs> But definitely my coach is one of my I shouldn't have said anything. If I wouldn't have said anything, if I wouldn't have said I was going to get it right, he would have put that on Yeah, I would have put, I would have put, uh, I thought he was making a joke. <laughs> we'll count that one as a right. We're, we're on the same wavelength here. Next one is Jeff Hardwick. And then Mondo. What is my biggest fear? I don't know. Uh, Ooh, biggest fear. Is... I have to think about that one. I don't even... Yeah. I mean, we're, as pool halters, we're naturally kind of, Reckless guys, we don't necessarily throw the risks. We're we're pretty safe jumpers. He and I have never had an injury pole vaulting or anything, so we're not really scared of injury. Um, we're not really scared of failure. We've been we've not, been not heights, not, not heights. heights, not, not heights, really definitely. heights. No. Um, man, spiders? No, you know I, I'm the guy at the house that gets rid of the spiders and the snakes and whatnot. He's not afraid of pole breaks. He broke a pole when he was six years old. Oh come on, you're gonna put another thing. Uh, I, yeah, it is a good one. That's pretty good. Now, now you're putting the pressure on me. Now it's a good I one. Th I think it. Competition. Oh, yeah. You gotta be afraid of no hiding. Yeah. NH. Yeah, NH. Yeah, 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 no I, hiding. That's what I thought. No mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every jumper, man. We, we come to a competition, and to get over the first bar is some of the hardest thing. Even for a professional, Mondo, have you have you ever gone to a meet? No hiding. Uh, one meet at the New Balance Nationals, and uh, my sophomore year last year, yeah. which was it was like the most it was probably the most devastating thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really it really is because like especially like even like Texas relays like I think my hardest jump that's the competition I made 590. Mm -hmm. The hardest jump of that competition was making uh, five. 35 whatever the first the first know, ball right that was the hardest jump not even the 590 like my best meet in high school jumping the first bar at 13 feet i almost no hided it was crazy <laughs> yeah um but the only time i've ever no hided was me trying to get into the olympic trials in 2012 i tried to jump i came into a meeting and i tried to put the bar on 560 when i was only that was your only one yeah my only bar it was the only one that counted it was the only bar that would have gotten me into the trials huh. and uh my personal best was 550. So mm -hmm. we kind of took a long shot and went for the uh, went for the mark that would have gotten me into the 2012 Olympic trials. You just started there. Started there. Why? But I didn't make it, and I didn't get to jump in the 2012 Olympic trials. Why you, why you just starting there? Why you, why didn't you like get up there? You know. Well, you see, I had done it before, or, and, I, and I jumped 30, 40, 50, and like, then went out at or 60. Or go like 30, and then go to 60, or whatever you're doing. I had a great warm up. We warmed up with, oh, okay. in this meet. Good we warmed warm up. up with a bar, you know. Why well, wasn't there? It's, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 you, it's one of those things. No hiding. It wasn't devastating for me. It was just one of those things you never want to do again. But this was this was New Balance. This was nationals, though. Yeah. So that kind of hurt. Yeah, that you, was kind of. You really travel out for it. I mean, I wanted yeah, to be in the Olympic trials, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. That's true. But, you know, you, you get on the bubble the first time and you'll never do it again. I was on the bubble in 2016 when the next Olympic trials came around. Is that a record? I bet you won your next national championship in the two, wouldn't it? That is true. Yeah. Yeah, you sure did. <laughs> yeah. You come back with a serious fire after no height. That is uh, true. Definitely. Oh, if I wasn't an athlete, what would I do? <laughs> I mean, this one's probably pretty easy. I don't know. I don't know, actually. I don't know. You, you, you know me pretty well. Where, uh, <laughs> what, what did I do in college? Oh, can I give him hints? I don't think I can give him oh, hints. Oh, no, no. I know that, but, like, yeah. Well, like, I already know that. But, like, I think, no, put something, put something other than that. Put something other than that? Like, no, not like, yeah, because I know, I know you're like, yeah. you're not like, oh, okay. you have to be a soldier after this. Or like, you're gonna, I mean, uh, yeah, army, I'm in the like, army, so reserve. yeah, that doesn't really count if I wasn't, I'm already a soldier. I, other than that, other I than that. that, okay, that's that. smart. Yeah, I know that. Um, other than that, ooh, <laughs> he put like plumber or something. <laughs> what did he put? So you think he, if he wasn't an athlete? If, if I wasn't an athlete, what would I be? <laughs> I would be, uh, son of a biscuit. I know what you put. I would work. I would probably work. Uh, you probably just put some like insurance salesman on there or mm -mm, something. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's something that you would do. I would do. Yeah. Okay. It'd be something that you would do. It'd be more something you just do 
after you have a great pole vault career uh -huh. and you, you kind of just settle down and you kind of retire and now you're just a okay <laughs> be a horse trainer close it's cl cowboy close. yeah it's cowboy. Same same thing. Thing. horse trainer a cowboy yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. same thing i ride horses for a living yeah, exactly. you know i ride horses and teach oh. lessons for a living you're so, that's good. You're so awesome that's good. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. that's good yeah. not many people know that about me that i that i've always worked with horses my whole life and if i if i didn't uh if i didn't take care of animals i don't know what i would do yeah. <laughs> he, he somehow i asked the question he got the answer before me <laughs> all right your turn what frustrates me most Ooh. Like, I keep this sports related, okay? Like, I mean, kind of just like the, the generic answer. Like, that's probably like, what's what is it? Failure. Nah, well, we already went over. Yeah. You know when you when the kids they ten feet yeah. they come in you gotta yeah. wait two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not that's not this though. But oh, yeah, that yeah. is that is pretty much the worst. Yeah. That pretty much is failure. Well, you know when you're Mondo, he has the. The awesome thing about Mondo is he's mm. a world record holder, but he still has to compete in high school. Not to say that there aren't great high school competitors out there right now. It's just different. You, you don't come to Lausanne for the Diamond League meeting and expect to have to wait to come in. Mondo's going to jump the first bar, bro. Am I right? The first bar is going to be 40, with the 540. Yeah, yeah, probably. If it's 540, you wouldn't be really yeah, the, the yeah. smart. I don't know. He may pass at 570. It's good for me. Oh, 570. <laughs> I don't know about that. No. I don't know. I got started at 570. Yeah, but when you come into a competition and there's all different levels of competitors, sometimes you'll be sitting for three or four hours before you start. Here, he gets to start right at the beginning, if he wants to. It might be only a 10-minute wait. That's, <laughs> that's what I used to say is frustrating for me. I had to, sometimes, he wins on, sometimes he wins on his first jump in high school. That's no, not, no. I can say that because I I can brag on him. No, He's not this, gonna say that. this year every every this year every meet. Yeah, every meet every meet was. Every I came in because I, I came in at 17 and 17 yeah. is going to win pretty much every competition. Yeah. Till antalet höjdhoppare som är på plats Sofie Skog, Erika Kinsey och Bianca Salming och till min hjälp så har jag Johan Storåkers här också som står redo med ett frågebatteri om hur ni tänker inför morgondagens Diamond League tävling här Bahaskalan på Stockholm Stadion. Varsågod. Vi börjar med Rika. Du hoppar bra den senaste tiden, eh, tiden. innehållande bland annat N94 i en tävling i Holland på nationaldagen. Kan du beskriva lite känslan under de senaste tävlingarna? Ja, det har ju inte känts superbra. Så det kanske var... Det var väldigt förvånande att det gick så bra, de här tävlingarna. Men det är kanske är det som är bra också, att jag sätter inte sådana förväntningar. Att jag ja, bara går in och hoppar och inte tänker så mycket. Eh, om vi går till Sofie, nu har du tävling här på Anrika Stockholms stadion imorgon. Kan du beskriva lite vilken fas du ligger i din säsong med träning, tävling och uppbyggnad mot Berlin och liknande mål? Ja, precis. Nej, men jag var um, i slutet av uh, maj nu så var jag på ett nästan två veckor långt läger i Italien. Uh, då tränade vi på men vi har släppt lite på mängden, gått på lite mer kvalitet. Så uh, jag har kört en tävling och egentligen släppt på, på träningen efter det. Så det, vi ligger i, i den här brytningsfasen mellan tung träning och någon slags topp. Okej, okay, apropå säsongen hittills, vi går till Bianca. Du hade 5775 poäng, sjukkamp i Schweiz. Mm. Uh, kan du beskriva dina resultat där och din känsla? Uh, alltså jag har hunnit köra två mångkamper uh, redan, och, men det känns lite så här ostabilt. Det är alltid någon gren som kanske går skitbra och sen så är det någon som går verkligen dåligt. Så att det blir väldigt så här ostabilt, därför blir inte den poängen jag vill. Uh, men det känns som att liksom jag, bara jag får dem rätt alltså, så kommer det gå bra att liksom, stämma. Kan du kommentera höjdhoppandet lite speciellt hittills under utomhussången 2018? Ja, så det blev ju en väldigt bra början, så här otippat. Det var, jag tänkte ju bara mest bara, men det här får vi en så här träningstävling. Men sen så var det så himla bra förhållande och så himla bra känsla. Så att eh, första tävlingen var ju skitbra och sen dess har det känt, haft en bra känsla liksom. Det känns som att jag börjar få en lite bättre stabilitet kanske. Så att eh, det ska bli kul. Eh, 
Om vi går till Rika, det här är ju historisk mark och det finns många minnen, speciellt i höjdopp härifrån, världsrekord och annat. Vad har du för förväntningar inför Bauerskalan 2018 på uppskattade Stockholms stadion? Ja, nej men jag bara gå in och göra lika som jag har gjort nu senaste tävlingarna. Ja, vad ska jag säga? Jag har mina mål och mina... Jag vet vad jag vill och vad jag kan, så jag hoppas att jag får visa det imorgon och resten av sommaren, så får vi se. Om vi går till Sofie, vilka besked vill du ha imorgon och vilka tävlingar kommer även direkt efter det här och hur ser du på dem? Först och främst imorgon så vill jag ha men, lite kvitto på att, att jag är i den fasen som jag, som jag känner att jag är. Att det beror på börja på att släppa mer och mer på, på träningen och jag har fått bra svar på träning. Så jag vill eh, verkligen ut och testa mig själv i tävlingssammanhang eh, på riktigt. Eh, så en bra känsla vill jag ha med mig imorgon. Eh, och sen eh, väntar en tävling i Tyskland nästa vecka och efter det så är det Sollentuna GP. Så målet är väl egentligen att tävla på ganska mycket nu och få tävlingsvana och bli... Eh, ja, det är, det är en helt annan grej att tävla mot och träna så att jag behöver tävla igång mig. Det ska bli kul. Ja, apropå förväntningen för morgondagen. Bianca, du är en stockholm tjej, du representerar Trubergs fridragsklubb. Nu kommer du tävla här inför hemma publik eh, med en enorm stämning här just i Stockholm och denna fridragsborg. Vad känslan så här ett dygn för? Eh, alltså faktiskt så har jag försökt att inte tänka så mycket för att jag vill inte bli liksom... Jag vill inte göra för stor grej av det för att då vet jag att man lätt spänner till sig och att det bara blir liksom kanske som förra året. Så att jag vet inte, jag försöker bara tänka som vilken tävling som helst och försöka få kontroll över den här stabiliteten och hoppas att det blir bra liksom. Eh, Erika, vi som följt dig eh, under en tid har ju sett lite vilka olika tränare du har, eh, men du har bytt nu en del. Kan du beskriva vilken tränare du har idag, hur du ser på det samarbetet? Eh, jag kör lika som förra året. Eh, det är en polsk tränare som heter Tom. Min man hjälper till och Linus är med och hjälper till också. Så att det, det funkar bra och det kör på det. Ja, hur är upplägget? Är det olika i USA, Europa? Ja. Nej, jag är här med, ja, alltså jag, tyvärr så kan ju varken Tom eller Daniel följa med eh, till Europa. Det kan hända att de kommer att sluta säsongen. Eh, men då förhoppningsvis har jag Linus på några tävlingar nu i sommar. Vi får se. Eh, Sofie, du har ju varit med rätt många mässkap nu får man ändå säga. Hur är känslan inför Europamässkapen i Berlin som stundar i början av augusti? Nej, men det, det är ju så. Det gick, ju, det gick ganska snabbt för mig så var jag med i, alltså på mästerskap och sen så har jag gjort alla sedan dess egentligen. Och det är en ny känsla varje år. Skillnaden i år kanske mot förra året att jag känner mig mycket mer så här lugn och trygg i mig själv. Jag vet vilken träning jag gör och vilken träning jag behöver. Vilket gör att vi kan lägga upp det bra inför augusti. Så det känns jätteskönt och jag ser verkligen fram emot en, en bra sommar. Och förhoppningsvis så är verkligen piken där i början av augusti. Eh, Rika, kan du också kommentera lite sommaren mot Berlin och andra mål? Eh, ja, men alltså jag kommer att tävla ganska mycket i sommar. Men det är just för att få bra träning. Och just nu har jag ingen tränare med mig på tävlingarna. Eh, eller på träningarna heller, så att då, då hjälper det att, att få den här sköna tävlingskänslan och trygghet i, det, i hoppningen. Eh, och de, alltså nu, kom, nu tränar jag på i sommar också, så att eh, förhoppningsvis få formen i augusti. Så de här tävlingarna på vägen, jag är inte riktigt, jobbar inte efter resultat så mycket. Eh, det får, jag bara hitta nya bitar i varje tävling och sen förhoppningsvis få de höga höjderna i slutet på sommaren. Eh, Bianca, om vi tittar i morgondagens eh, höjdoppstävling, men, eh, vad du har för känsla, vad du vill ha tekniska besked eller annat. Och, men även framöver här mot eh, utomhussången 2018, eh, fortsatt under sommaren. Alltså just nu så känner jag bara att jag vill bara tävla så mycket som möjligt. Även fast det inte går så vill jag bara tävla känns som. Eh, det känns så jäkla kul att... Men det känns som att jag har en bra känsla i kroppen och det känns som att det kan bli bra hela tiden. Så att det är bara när det ska hända, det är det man inte vet bara. Men jag har en bra känsla. Så att, ja. Ja, vi hoppas att det blir stora framgångar imorgon för alla tre. Det är fritt för frågor.
För då vet jag att det är fler som väntar på enskilda intervjuer med er. Så då tänkte jag att ni får ställa er upp. Och så kan väl någon av er i alla fall grabba tag i diamanten. Så kan ni ha den eh, gemensamt. <laughs> eh, mellan varandra på något eh, grant sätt. Och i och med det så tackar vi er så mycket också för att ni kom hit. Och eh, önskar er stort lycka till i eh, höjdhoppstävlingen då. Imorgon.
Berglund. Och eh, Moa Hjelmer och Angelica Bengtsson. Tryckfällsnissa hade varit framme på din eh, skylt. Det var därför jag vek undan den lite så här. Ja, så det, ah, det var inget bra. Så, eh, så att jag tänker att eh, jag hälsar er varmt välkomna hit. Även om ni är bekanta många av er med Stockholm så är eh, det en extra speciell helg i Stockholm ju. När Bahaskalan flyttar in på Stockholms stadion. Nu till eh, Johan Storåkers som sitter inne på goa frågor inför morgondagen. Ja, eh, vi börjar med Angelica. Eh, du hoppade i torsdags Oslo. 4,61, 3, men med mer smak. Kan du beskriva hoppningen i den norska huvudstaden? Ja, efter eh, två tävlingar där jag hade nollat så kändes det väldigt eh, skönt att för det första klara nu. Och 41 och 51 var väldigt bra hopp, stabila hopp. Sen 61 var inte ett jättebra hopp. Men eh, kom över ändå. Det känns också tryggt att eh, ha en eh, hög lägsta nivå. Och eh, sen var det några bra försök på 71. Um, det första försöket eh, försvann av att det eh, av eh, stavstrul typ. Eh, det var för, för liten skillnad mellan eh, mina stavar. Och, så det misstaget tänker jag inte göra om nu eh, på söndag imorgon. Och därmed så kan det nog gå väldigt bra imorgon, tror jag. <laughs> eh, Moa, du har haft en del stabila resultat hittills under utomhusången. Kan du berätta för oss lite om tankarna om de tävlingar som varit hittills? Eh, ja, <laughs> det har varit fokus på stafett. Eh, så som jag brukar börja säsongen. Sen var det en landslagsstafett också på 400. Det var väl till ovanligheterna. Men det var ganska skönt att få till en 400 i stafettsammanhang inför det här, den här tävlingen. Um, och sen uh, så uh, har jag väl, jag har ju en tävlingsplanering men ibland så får man också bara ta tillfället i akt. Och det var det som hände uh, förra helgen på Sajo. Det var så himla bra väder så att det fanns ingen anledning att inte ta, vara, ta tillvara på, uh, på de förhållandena. Och uh, då gick det fort och det uh, känns jättebra. Just uh, Sajo och den här 400 sträckan i Norge, kan du beskriva närmare hur de loppen var? Eh, nej men det var självklart ganska nervöst inför 400 meter i Oslo eftersom eh, jag inte har sprungit 400 ute på, på de här tiderna på väldigt länge. Eh, men det gick bra så att, eh, det kändes väldigt stabilt. Jag blev inte speciellt trött eh, som jag trodde jag skulle bli. Så att, eh, det kändes positivt. Eh, och sen så var det halva distansen 200 på eh, Sajo och... Eh, Ja, det var härliga vindar och precis vad som är tillåtet. Och det var bara samma sak där. Eh, ta tillbaka på det. Och det kändes också väldigt starkt och stabilt. Eh, och det är en väldigt skön känsla att inte behöva kriga för tiderna på samma sätt. Utan det, det bara kommer. Ja, vi går på samma tema lite. Kalle Berglund, eh, du har tävlat här på löpningens blå band. 1500 meter, lite i början av eh, säsongen, utomhus. Vad har varit dina tankar? Vi som har följt resultaten har, tycker jag att du är på gång lite grann kan man säga kanske. Ja, jag tycker att det har gått eh, helt okej. Okay. Tyvärr har det inte varit några snabba lopp. Vi har haft ganska långsamma passeringar upp till 800. Så det har varit svårt att springa riktigt snabbt, eh, tyvärr. Eh, men jag tycker ändå att eh, formen eh, går åt rätt håll. Eh, och vi valde att inte köra jättemycket banträning inför de första tävlingarna. Så inför mitt första lopp hade jag sprungit bara 1200 meter i riktiga spikskor. Så eh, också jag blir bättre och bättre för varje lopp. Eh, så jag är ändå ganska nöjd med vad jag ligger till formmässigt. Men eh, det har varit kul att få ett riktigt snabbt lopp. Men det kommer nog eh, förhoppningsvis i, i sommar. Eh, Arini, du har bland annat Staffett, SM, Sai och så vidare. Hur har löpningen varit hittills på tävlingar? Ja, alltså det har varit bättre än förut, vilket har varit jätte, jätteskönt. Men eh, jag kämpar fortfarande liksom under mina lopp. Men med lite mer träning så eh, kommer det nog rulla på riktigt bra. Eh, 
Angelica 461 i Oslo, men med mer smak. Vad kan vi förvänta oss här på klassiska Stockholmsstadion av eh, Hässelbys världsstjärna? Ja, jag tror att det kommer bli en riktigt fin tävling. Vi har, det är bra konkurrens och eh, jag kommer fokusera på att plocka höjder. Och, Absolut, ett, ett nytt besök på svenska rekordet satt jag på. Oh, men sen, sen kan ju allting hända. Ja, Moa, om vi tittar lite också på morgondagen. Du är ju ja, likhet med alla här från en av arrangörsklubbarna. Du är Stockholm tjej, du känner dig hemma på Stockholmsstadion. Vad är känslan så här ett dygn för fridåtsfesten här? Eh, nej, men det är en bra känsla. Eh, man blir ju såklart eh, lite extra glad när man tittar upp och ser vädret. För att, eh, det, är ju, det är ju rätt beroende av, den, av eh, goda vinnar och värme för att, göra, för att göra bra resultat. Eh, så att just nu så nej, men det känns det väldigt bra och det ska bli kul att få kliva in här imorgon och stå inför ett eh, ja, stort publik av förhoppningsvis och känna peppen. Eh. Om vi tittar på själva tävlingen för dig, är det något speciella besked du vill ha? Känsla, resultat och så vidare? Eh, ja, jag jagar ju såklart kvalgränsen till EM, men eh, det känns väl som att det är någonting jag skulle kunna klara av om, om allt stämmer imorgon. Så att det är väl det som jag har som huvudmål och sen hoppas jag ju såklart att det går så fort som det bara kan gå. Så får vi se. Kalle, det är en lite speciell distans här imorgon, 1000 meter. Hur ser du på det mellan 8 och 1500? Eh, det ska bli spännande. Eh, vi får se. Det är egentligen bara andra gången jag springer i hela min karriär. Så eh, det ska bli kul. Och eh, framförallt ska det bli kul att springa. För jag har hört att det kommer att komma mycket folk hit imorgon. Och kanske få springa för ett fullsatt stadion. Det är något som man alltid drömt om att göra. Och eh, det ska bli väldigt kul. Det finns ju en viss herre med namn Rågestedt som har det svenska rekorder på 1000 meter. Överlever det imorgon? Eh, det tror jag inte. Vi är, vi är två stycken som har bra chans att slå det. Och jag tror det kan bli väldigt jämnt mellan oss. För just mellan 8 och 15 är vi ganska jämna på slisa på. Eh, jag och Andreas. Så jag tror att eh, det blir ett bra lopp imorgon. Och jag tror att vi båda kan springa ganska snabbt. Men sen är det som slår det av oss. Det, det återstår att se. Det ska bli kul. Eh, om vi går till Arini, eh, du tillhör ju samma träningsgrupp som Moa Hjelmer under coach Roland Bergman. Jag vet att ni brukar vara här en del och träna. Hur ska det vara, hur ska det bli att delta i en världsskala på hemmaplan? Och du är även stockholmare nu menar ja. <laughs> eh, ja, det var ju ett tag sedan jag var med. Så det ska, vara, det ska bli jätte, jättekul att bara få visa att man är tillbaka och... Eh, Kämpa mot de andra snabba tjejerna och bara försöka sänka sin tid. Så det ska bli jätte, jättekul. Eh, du nämnde någonting där tidigare om att du kämpar lite under loppen. Är det något speciellt du vill liksom uppnå imorgon angående avslappning och hur det ska kännas under själva loppet här på Diamond League, IAF Diamond League i Stockholm, Bauerskala? Eh, ja, inte ha ont. Känna att kroppen är med mig helt och hållet. Eh, Ja, att det flyter på helt enkelt. Om vi går till Angelica. Du har ett nytt samarbete med vf 5 i Stavhopp från 91, Peter Widén. Vad betyder han för dig? Det känns jättebra. Vi har en liknande bakgrund. Varit i Frankrike lite, varit på många delar av världen och hoppat i Stav. Och så vi känner... Vi känner igen varandra i varandra och det är fakt- det, träningen går väldigt bra. Han, eh, han jobbar också på eh, Grimslöv ja, eh, på, på en skola med idrott också så han är väldigt eh, eh, påläst. Så, nej men det känns väldigt bra för hela samarbetet och också att vi är en grupp och hela min träning är på plats i Växjö och rutinerna går och det, blir, det känns verkligen som att man blir bättre och bättre varje dag på rutin. Så det känns väldigt bra. 
Eh, om vi går till alla här och tittar lite Bauerskalan men även vidare sommaren 2018. Eh, vad har ni för förväntningar? Vi har ett Europamöskap i Berlin bland annat. Vi kan börja med Arini. Ja, alltså det kom, för mig blir det ett bonus om jag klarar kvalet. Eh, men tills dess så kommer jag bara tävla och träna ordentligt och försöka sänka mina tider och eh, ja, komma tillbaka. Ja, Kalle, här har du Bauerskalan på hemmaplan, men du har också en vidare viktig sommar. Eh, hur, hur går tankarna just nu? Eh, tankarna är väldigt eh, det är spännande. Jag har en väldigt bra bakgrund bakom mig. Och jag kommer som sagt nu efter den här tävlingen börja, börja med snabbhetsträningen som jag saknar för att springa riktigt snabbt på framförallt 800 och 1000. Men även det jag kommer behöva i, eh, på, inför 1500 möjligt att springa eh, bra avslutningar. Och vilket kommer behövas in, eh, inför EM. Och eh, jag känner mig väl förberedd än så länge och jag tror att eh, det ska bli en väldigt rolig sommar. Med Kalle pratade vi lite om sträckor, Moa. Det var, där var det 8, 15 och lite tusen. Hur ser du på 2, 400 och säsongsupplägget? Eh, nej, men fokus ligger ju på 400. Det är liksom det är min pra- paraddistans. Och, eh, och som sagt, för min, min målsättning är att kvala här imorgon. Men gör jag inte det så kommer jag fortsätta att eh, jaga tiderna. Eh, på tävlingen. Det känns ändå ganska tryggt för att det är eh, första augusti som det är dags för EM. Um, men jag kommer nog tävla på 200 också så kvalar jag där så blir det en bonus. Uh, och sen har vi dessutom 400 meter stafett uh, som vi förhopp- förhoppningsvis har ett lag till EM på också. Så att, uh, ja, det är mycket. EM börjar alltså i Berlin 7 augusti. Uh, Angelica, avslutningsvis, du var medaljör i Amsterdam. Eh, vad kan vi förvänta oss i Berlin av Angelica Bengtsson? Ja, medalj räknar jag nästan med. <laughs> eh, nej, men det, det, det ser bra ut nu och jag tror bara att vi kommer bli bättre ifrån här. Och, eh, när man tittar på motståndet så, så känns det inte så överväldigande heller. Okej. Eh, frågor till de aktiva. Uh, sorry for get crashing the Swedish conference in English, but uh, I'm not exactly fluent. Um, if I could ask quickly, Angelica, uh, good performance in Oslo the other night, 460. Do you think maybe that indicates that you're on course to try and get a medal at the Europeans? And for you, is the summer all built around the Europeans in Berlin? Yes, uh, it is. The main uh, the main goal is uh, the Olympics, of course. But uh, for the for this year, it's uh, it's the European Championships, and uh, as I have taken uh, a bronze uh, both outdoor in the European Championships and twice indoor, I'm uh, uh, surely aiming for uh, a medal this year also, and maybe a silver or. And coming home to compete in front of a home crowd, how does that differ for you? Like, is it more nerves, more excitement, more pressure even? Uh, I would think it would. Uh, it's more comfort, uh, more comfortable. Uh, I've been here many times before, and I'm feeling the uh, the the crowd is on my side. <laughs> so I, I'm really looking forward to uh, to jump in front of a big. Swedish crowd. And is there a height you'd have in mind tomorrow that you'd be happy with, or is it just go out and compete? I am. Um, uh, I really want to take the Swedish national record back yeah, as, as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Andra frågor? Any further questions? Om inte så tackar vi. Det är ju fyra aktiva från arrangörsklubbarna. Eh, Arini. Kalle och Moa från Spårvägen och Angelica från Hässelby. Ja, tack så jättemycket. Och det finns förfrågningar på enskilda intervjuer också. Så att res på er. Hugg tag i den där diamanten så tar vi en bild på er i den miljön först. Sen blir det lite enskilda bilder också runt hörnet.